Washington football. Woo! Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Burgundy Zone, to the Carpe Diem episode, featuring a very special guest. But first, my name is Kyle. I am the host, and I'm also joined by my two co-hosts, Michael Hall and Michael Reed. And like I had just said, we are joined by Nathan Bailey, Burgundy Breakdown. Thank you so much for joining us, Nathan. Oh, thanks for having me, guys. I'm glad to be on. No, absolutely, and I, I love that T-shirt. What So fitting to be wearing yes. a Beat Philly T-shirt right now. Beat Philly, baby. 150%. It's almost like that was on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Very good planning. But, Nathan, if you can, just give us a brief description about yourself, how long you've been a fan, uh, and then um, what do you do anything besides just being a fan? So I'll start with the last question you asked. No, uh, that's all I do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, I've, I've been a fan my uh, my whole life. My grandmother got me into the Redskins. Uh, you know, it's, it's in my blood. Uh, I, I run the Burgundy Breakdown at the Burgundy BD on Twitter. Um, I, I started it. I used to write quite a bit. And then I went back and uh, got my MBA at LSU. So I just kind of took a break from writing. And I just nice. interact with everybody. But, uh, you know, hoping to pick it back up soon. But for right now, I just like to jump on and, and uh, you know, talk a little nonsense every now and then. Mm-hmm. Hey, you came to the right place to talk nonsense, sir. I, I, can't, I can't stress that enough. But we have a great episode lined up for you guys. Um, we're first going to get into fan questions, and then we're actually going to go and break down the game afterwards. But first, let's start with the colonel who has a fantastic question, and that is, do you think that the team is in a rebuild mode currently, Hall? Uh, I mean – if you want to call it a rebuild because going into the season, that's what it was meant to be. And it was so-called what it was going to be. So with that being said, uh, I would not call it a rebuild, but I would call it a, a build in process. If you want to call it that. (laughs) That's a great way to put it. What about you, Reed? Do you think that this is, I know everyone has been talking about it. They said, this is a rebuild year. It's a rebuild year. You're not supposed to expect that much. Do you believe it is? Um, when anytime you're playing for the division, I don't think it's necessarily a rebuild. I will say that I think over the next couple of years, it's going to be a retooling year. It's not necessarily going to be rebuilding, but there's some foundation in place. You're just going to keep building off of what you have. So I wouldn't necessarily say a rebuild. I I would say uh, you're ammoing up a little bit. That's what you're going to be doing. I'll do it a little bit better, Colonel. I'll say it's a renovation year. I don't think it's a rebuild year. I think that they have the pieces in place that they need to kind of have the building blocks. Um, But... I, I don't think that it's a complete overhaul. I said it early on in the season that I thought that um, you, you don't need to rebuild because when you say rebuild, it means you're losing. And I still think that you can retool and get better while losing at the same exact time. What about you, Nathan? Yeah, I think I agree with the with what each of you guys are saying. To me, when I think of a rebuild, I think of something – I think of a situation where you're starting from almost scratch. And, right. and knowing that we have a strong core of players – they're going to be up for new contracts in the next couple of years, guys that we're going to look to bring back and continue to build that core. I just, uh, that core, I don't know that you can look at that and think of it as a rebuild. Mm, right. um, when, when you think about it, if we add the right one or two pieces to be a, a strong playoff contender, I, I don't see how you could look at that and think rebuild. Right. So, and, yeah. And just to add a little cherry on top of that, like if you remember back when Ron Rivera, Ron Rivera first came in, he said he took this job because he watched the tape and he saw the young talent. And he didn't think to himself, like, oh, this is a rebuild. This is like a, a team that we can win now. And hey, I, they're not winning right. exactly right now, but they're pretty damn close. Right. I was just about to say, not just strong players, but strong young players. There's a <laughs> lot of good young talent on this team, like yeah. you said. And I, I just, it's, we should all be very excited. Yeah. And then his, you know, next- it's funny you say that. Uh, oh, I was just saying, I got a buddy of mine that always is getting on me. He's kind of a pessimistic fan, I like to call him. <laughs> and he's been trying to, t- you know, chirp on that bandwagon forever that that we're rebuilding that we're this we're that and just trying to explain to him the core young players are too good that right. that d line it's it, there's too much talent there to just say that this season's a wash because that's just ridiculous yeah. right absolutely and then his next question i think is actually a huge topic of discussion i don't think it's been talked about enough and that is how long will they be able to retain this d line before it gets diluted with contract extensions and guys having to leave because they can't pay them nathan it's a good question. When you look at the board, right, we have I and I locked up for a couple of years. 
We have Allen going into his fifth year option. Payne, presumably, we're going to extend to his fifth year option. We have to make decisions on those guys. You'd love to keep all three of them as your core players. And I'm not even thinking sweat yet. And I'm, you know, because we're talking a couple of years before we have to make that decision. Those rookie contracts are fantastic when they work out in your favor. But uh, in the short term, having to figure out those three guys, I'm glad to know that Ionitis is on board. And I'm glad that we got him for a relatively reasonable price point depending on how the rest of the roster shakes out, depending on how the rookies play out. For example, our next couple of drafts are going to be very important in keeping those guys, right? Mm-hmm. Because if we can fill out the rest of the roster with rookie contracts, that's how you can, that's how you can beef up one particular position group that has a couple of studs. Right. Yeah, and it's so funny how, like, five years ago, we're talking about why don't they ever invest into the D-line? <laughs> and, and now we're going to be put in a very weird position and having to decide who's going to get paid. So let me ask that question to you, Reed. How long do you think they have before things start, you know, I'm not going to say fall apart, but when right. things start having to separate themselves? Well, I, I think you're going to end up seeing a little bit of that this offseason. I talked about it last podcast with uh, Ryan Kerrigan and Ryan Anderson taking off. I mean, it's going to it's going to be a pretty big step for uh, Montez Sweat and Chase Young to go and not have those kind of guys backing them up and not being able to rely on them and having to play a larger role. But I think if anybody can handle it, it's those two guys. But yeah, I think at least a couple of years before you start seeing having to make the major decisions on the defensive tackles. So I don't know, I would say a couple of years or so. So we got, we got a window after this year of two years or so that we can really use this D line to get going. Yeah, and honestly, Colonel, I think it's going to be – I think it's rearing its ugly head sooner rather than later. I think this offseason they're going to have to make some decisions, and I know that they have Tim Settle there, a guy who's been performing very yeah. well um, without mm-hmm. Matt Ioannidis being there. He has been a backup and has done incredibly well. He deserves more reps, but maybe he could be a trade piece or possibly Deron Payne or Jonathan Allen who's expected to get paid in the offseason. So I would like to see jo- – I think Jonathan Allen is the kind of guy that is a Ron Rivera guy. You know, yeah, man of the year – he takes his job seriously, so I would love to see him. And there's going to have to be a sacrifice. And, and I think that's that's the really tough question is yeah. who is going to be that sacrifice. Right yeah. now, Jonathan Allen's the best one, too. Yeah. The, yeah. Overall, this yep. yeah. It's amazing. And what it's about kind you? of funny. They have their different niches, yeah. too, right? They, yep. I-90 is, a, is that kind of jack-of-all-trades hard worker and also on a reasonable contract. Payne is very much the run stuffer, seems yep. to always be disrupting it. And Allen is just – like you said, he's, he's playing the best out of all three of them, you know, yeah. but he's more of a, a hybrid, I guess you could say, yeah. Yeah. right? In that yeah. smaller, m- smaller size uh, uh, mold. And so it's just, it's just interesting. It's not like you have three of the exact same guy, right? Right. So how, how do you decide what strength to cut off your squad? Yeah. yeah, exactly. And that's a very good point. What about you, Hall? How long do you think it's going to take? Um, with this core guys, I like, I think it's like Reese. I think it's a window of maybe two, maybe three years max. So it's like you mentioned, uh, Kyle, we got guys like Tim Settle that if it came down to it and we had to look, <clears throat> a release one of the guys, or not release, but trade away one of the guys or not resign one of the guys, you can have a guy like Tim Settle maybe step in to go opposite of a Jonathan Allen or opposite of a Deron Payne. Right. Uh, you got a guy like Smith Williams who we drafted in the seventh round last year from Oklahoma State. You've seen him on special teams making plays here and there. Maybe he maybe steps up and gets into a, like maybe another uh, a second year leap going into next year and gets mm-hmm. some role, get some type of uh, playing next year. And uh, I think I have faith in our draft that uh, we'll keep producing through the draft. If you look back to those Carolina teams and Ron Rivera teams, they had a strong front seven, always great linebackers, great defensive line. They like to play. They like to pay defensive linemen, pay defensive players. So, I mean, you never know. They end up paying all the defensive players and just keep right. this core and maybe take like a, uh, a Ravens type of team mm. approach where, you know, heavy defense, don't rely on the offense as much. Yeah, and that's a great point because the Ravens are a kind of organization you should <laughs> idle yourself um, mm-hmm. after. You know what I mean? Now, yeah. Colonel's next question is, it, it has to do with D-Hall because D-Hall earlier in the week said Ron Rivera isn't fooling around. So what other players are or slash should be feeling the heat? And I'll start with you, Nathan. Ooh, that's fun. Uh, yeah. First off, Antonio Gandy Golden needs to – he needs to step it up, right? And I know you're talking about an injury plague season, a mm-hmm. COVID off season. He's a young rookie guy, mm-hmm. right? I'm definitely not writing him off, but he he looked lost out there, right? In the same way that that most of the fans are willing to jump on Dwayne at the end of last season and say, you need to know the system a little bit better. I want that from him as well, because yeah. watching him out there running routes, he looks lost. He doesn't look like he's in the system. And when you have an entire year to really just – 
work on your film, I expect your mind to be right and I'm waiting for your body to catch up. So that's definitely somebody who I think needs to, to, to step it up in a very big way. Um, setting him aside, I think our linebackers, somebody needs to step out from that group to take us into next year and in, a, in a bigger way than they've done so. If, if we were to go back and chart the first 16 weeks of the season and the first 15 games, you can find, you can cherry pick a game here and there where you can say, okay, this player looks like the top guy. This player looks right. like the top guy. Nobody is staying on top of that mountain. And I want to see somebody flying to this off season firmly on top of that mountain because we're going to add one or two pieces in that core. And so you're either part of it or you're not. And so I'm really curious to see how that plays out. Yeah. And I know a lot of people were saying, you know, well, you can't judge AGG because Dwayne was the quarterback, you know, he's kind of ruined the um, product you could say, but at the same time, AGG just did not look like he was ready to play under the lights. You know, it he, he looked like the stage was a little bit too big for him. And I was a huge AGG mark. I wanted them to draft him. But like you said, I didn't see any progress. I didn't see any development. I know that's kind of a mess up thing to ask of him. He just got activated off IR. But I was expecting to see somewhat of a progression. So let me ask that to you, Reed. What player or what player should be feeling the heat from Ron Rivera? Well, AGG almost looked like a fourth round pick from a small school. You know, it's crazy. <laughs> no, but I'm going to, I think you're hundred percent right. I, I expected a little bit more from him, but I'm going to keep it at the wide receiver position. I think you guys know where I'm going to go with this one. <laughs> young bobbles, young, no hands, <laughs> young oven <Yes>. mitts, <laughs> Steven Sims, Jr. Steven Sims has just been a thorn in my side the all season long. Uh, I don't know how you can flash so much big play ability during your rookie season and only have a couple of things to really work on, which is, looking the ball in and securing it and your route running and not improve on either of those things and actually take a step back in both categories going into your next year. So Steven Sims has just been such a disappointment. So many people had such high hopes for him to be the slot guy, be, be that big play wide receiver opposite, maybe even opposite Terry, but uh, he just, he hasn't been that. And actually he's hurt us more than he's helped us at this point. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a great one because that was one I was going to go with as a player. But to be honest, I, I flipped it today when I was thinking about when you sent it to me, Colonel, I was like, I know where I'm going with this. And I don't think it's a player. I think it's the owner. And if anyone should be feeling the heat, it's Dan <laughs> Snyder to know, stop making the picks. Obviously, mm -hmm. by Ron Rivera laying down the law and releasing Haskins, it was a message to Dan Snyder. And, you know, I'm the captain now. Go away. And that's, <laughs> that's in my opinion, that Dan Snyder needs to step away because, obviously, his decisions have made the team worse with the on-the-field decisions. I'm not going to say the business side, but on-the-field decisions needs to step the hell away. What about you, Hall? What player do you think that needs to feel the heat from Ron Rivera? Uh, I'm going to go a little bit off script, and it's not even like anything that he did because he didn't play this season, but obviously he didn't bring – he wasn't brought in by this regime of people other than Kyle Smith. I'm going to go Kelvin Harmon. People mm. have forgotten about Kelvin Harmon. Mm. He's uh was going to be supposedly a big piece coming into this season. Tore his ACL, got the surgery. I've seen on Twitter he's been rehabbing, rehabbing pretty well. So, uh, again, he looks like one of those possible maybe rotation of three to four or five receiver type guys. But coming off the injury, this is not the, the coaching staff that drafted you. Are you going to be able to make the roster? Are you going to be a fringe guy? Are you going to be able to contribute after the injury? So that's someone I'm looking forward to. Yeah, that's a good one. And yeah. Colonel's last question, he said it was optional. But I kind of like it. It's, it's fitting with what's going on. He said – is there any redemption for young quarterbacks like Josh Rosen and Dwayne Haskins who both faced varying question, uh, character concerns? Or will they be regulated to the Ryan Leaf, Jamarcus Russell, Johnny Menzel trash heap? And I'll start with you, Reed. Um, it's, it's weird because this is kind of like an unprecedented thing that we've seen over the last couple of years with, mm -hmm. with Josh Rosen and Dwayne Haskins. Usually, no matter what, a quarterback like that, a first-round pick with that much natural talent, people are going to give it a shot to. Uh, but – as we've seen, these guys, it, it, there's just something that rubs people the wrong way in the locker room with, with both of these guys, both of those guys. So I don't know. It's it's tough to say, but I, I mean, we've seen it the last two years and, and people are moving on from quarterbacks quite fast. I think, of course, Dwayne's going to get another shot, um, but I don't know how many more he's going to get. And I don't know what that shot will necessarily be. Yeah. And judging by Ben Standig's report um, from earlier in the week saying that, you know, did Dwayne lose the locker room based off of the COVID violation and the response from that player that was anonymous was he lost the locker room a long time ago. 
And so that kind of thing tells you, uh, no, it, it, unless he changes himself, along with Josh Rosen, one of the biggest things with Josh Rosen was that, that he was a huge douche. He's a douche. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> He's just a so, douchebag. Right. And so if you're going to continue going down that mindset, no, I don't think you're going to have any redemption. But once you right. realize that your, your, your shit does stink, then, yeah, I think that they could uh, totally have a redemption because they have the – qualities and traits of a good quarterback is just the other side of it it's the other x factor yeah. what about you nathan do you think that they have a shot at redemption i think it depends on where they land right i think it depends mm. on who decides to give them a shot yeah. Dwayne is a little bit different than rosen from what you guys just said right rosen's biggest problem he was just he was just a douchebag right mm. but <laughs> haskins he's lacking in self-awareness right yeah. i've known guys like that my whole life where they don't they'll do something that's very clearly over the line or something that is absolutely rubbing everybody in the room the wrong way. And they're looking around with a clueless look on their face because they can't even, they can't even get past that point of recognizing that what they just did is not something the rest of the room is okay with. And I'm not sure that you grow out of that, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, someone might give him a chance. Again, the guy is a, he's a confidence machine, right? If, if he can build himself into a position of confidence, uh, and build leadership around that strictly, but that's going to require a heck of a lot better play than what he's shown uh, to be capable of. So I, I'm not optimistic. I'll just put it that way. Mm. No, that, it, most likely a lot of people agree with you, Nathan. Yeah. What about you, Hall? Yeah, I'm kind of just going to pretty much a mixture of all three, what you guys said. Uh, it's pretty much on them if they're going to be able to humble themselves because, again, again, like I just said, the biggest thing on Josh Rosen was, yeah, he's a talented guy, but he's a douchebag. He thinks he knows everything. What's Dwayne Haskins thing? Everyone kind of, everyone pretty much says they like him. He's a nice kid. He's a good guy. It's just, like you said, he lacks self-awareness he's and he's just not mature. So I think that obviously with getting older, I think that Dwayne will mature a little bit more. Yeah. I think that you can kind of tell that once he got released, I think that's his rock bottom. I think that he's going to finally realize like, I got to do like the certain things I need to do to be able to at least be a backup in this league. I don't know, and, dude. He separated with his agent, like, it, yeah, and his yeah. agent was like pulling off I miracles did. to like, sh like to nullify the bad news about him skipping out on the media. Like, I, yeah. that was a but big that, warning. Yeah. So that could me. be a good thing right. for him to be like, I need to break ties with all the old my past things and just start fresh any, anywhere else. Like, new team, new agent new circle of friends, new everything. You know what I'm saying? So that's how I kind of look family. at it. You, you know it's bad when Ryan Leaf tweets at you that you're a dumbass and that <laughs> yeah. you're an idiot. Like that's a, exactly. And real fast, how many pastel polo shirts and Sperry shoes do you think Josh Rosen owns while, <laughs> while he's tweeting about the ozone and global warming? <laughs> Is that what he does? I'd even – yeah. yeah. oh, oh, yeah. What a loser. Yeah, never mind. I don't – yeah. I don't think he has any redemption <laughs> in his – Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Josh Rosen's been like that pretty much like – that's He's been, been like that since college. Yeah. yeah, since he was exactly. since he was coming out of high school. Even like yep. in high school, that's been the rap on him. So he was always just a stuck up dude. I don't think that he'll be like maybe a second string or practice squad guy for the rest of his life. But he comes from money, so at the end of the day, he doesn't yeah. really need the NFL. Right. Dwayne Haskins, I know, comes from money. I just think that he'll become a little bit mature, a little bit more older, and realize like. Damn, I was a little ass kid, and I needed to like grow up. So that's how I just kind of look at what, it. What what Josh but, Rosen needs to do is take that green thumb out of his ass. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also again, like Nathan said, it depends on landing spot. So yeah, yeah, hundred percent. It depends on the landing spot. If he's in a position where he can kind of progress under a solidified starter who is a a consummate professional. Carolina, I think, is perfect under Teddy Bridgewater. It'd be great yeah. for him. Or Russell Wilson yeah. in Seattle, I think, is a, a great situation for Dwayne to get, uh, go in because he's not expected to start anytime soon. But he could go in as a backup and possibly uh, prove a lot of people wrong. I think that's the best avenue for him. Now, it's almost well, like you know, I think that there's a couple of nuances that have come out in this time since he's been gone, right? Little things that have leaked out. But a couple of the nuances of the stories is with his agent. It was a mutual parting of yeah. ways, okay. right? And then you see there was the, the news floated about the Panthers being interested and then a very firm correction to say, this is our due diligence. Mm -hmm. You know, this, you know, essentially like, let's take a pause. We're not right. actively interested. Right. And so I think these types of things are starting to leak in. The best thing he can do is get somewhere with an aging veteran. Yeah. Um, you know, people have floated Pittsburgh in the past. But the problem is that I don't think that Pittsburgh is confident that Big Ben plays next year at this point. And so you definitely don't want to bring in a horse right. like Dwayne Haskins and hope that that you know he can be thrust into that kind of position. So yeah. uh, again, I'm I'm just not hopeful. 
XFL is calling his name. That's <laughs> yeah, and I, I saw that uh, what Johnny Menzel like uh, just signed He's with like a, a fan league. Seven on seven fan league. A the fan <laughs> control the fans league. call like 50% of the plays or something. That's crazy. Like that. I would dial up an all-out blitz every <laughs> single time. <laughs> Let's see how so well fun. that works out. Yeah. Well, you're, uh, you would never punt the ball, right? No, no. I, w- I would have some pump packages nobody's ever seen yeah. before. Thank you, Colonel. I told Colonel those were a great set of questions, oh, probably the best he's ever given us, and he always gives us great questions. Now, Teddy has a question for us, and this is regarding the draft. I know that we're going to look into the playoff matchup in a little bit, but in regards to the draft, with Justin Fields' stock dropping, would you trade up to get uh, Justin Fields? But I want to kind of just take this away from Justin Fields and kind of have this as a quarterback altogether. Are there any quarterbacks besides Trevor Lawrence, obviously, that you would be willing to go and trade up for, Nathan? So to answer that question in layers, right, as far as Justin Fields goes, no, I'm not trading up for Justin Fields. Uh, I get that he might slip a little bit, make him a little bit more easily easier to attain. I'm not interested in him if he falls to the latter part of the first round. Uh, I get that he's a very talented kid. I just don't I, – I personally have not watched anything on him that makes me want to make him the cornerstone of this franchise. D.C. is too volatile of a, of a marketplace of fans. It's not going to fly, okay? He, he needs room to grow a little bit more than that. And I'm also just not confident in his skill set. I know there's the adage, you know, you, you scout the player, not the helmet. But it's really hard to ignore the track record yep. that's come out of that school. It's, it's, it's just – it's not something I'm willing to, to, to take a gamble on. So, and I've, I've got the, the top uh, prospects pulled up here on my other screen. Um, and, and I've done some digging into it. You know, everybody throws out there, Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, right. As those next big name guys, I think Zach Wilson is going to go higher yeah. than we're going to be able to afford him. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that somebody gets into that second spot that second draft position. Um, I don't know if it's going to be a trade involved or if it's just going to stay as it is. That's where I think Zach Wilson goes. Mm. Uh, I think people are going to fall in love with him. He's got, you know, he's not six, five, but you're talking about a six foot three guy. He's got a decent prototypical size and some good playmaking gamer ability. Somebody's going to fall in love with him and take him way too early. Trey Lance, I'm just not interested in. Yeah, exactly. He's the new age NFL. Uh, Trey Lance. I'm, I'm not particularly interested in if he had played this year, I'd be more curious He's a guy where his hype is going to take him in the first round, uh, maybe towards the latter end of it. But realistically, he's he's a third round talent because he needs he needs a year or two to grow. Yeah. Um, and I'm not confident that Alex can carry us next year as as a bridge there, right? And I, I just don't want him to be thrust in that position. A guy who I'm intrigued about though, as maybe a third round prospect, is Mac Jones out of Alabama. Just a mm-hmm. guy that takes care of the football high completion percentage in college. And I know he's, he's thrown it to a lot of all-stars there, right? It, Alabama's always filled with all-stars, but anytime you can complete near 75% of your passes, you're somebody I'm curious about. And as a third round prospect, we could bring him in, have Kyle Allen here um, and just kind of bridge ourselves for a year and buoy, buoy the team based on the defense. That's intriguing to me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that's where I'm at with you. Uh, I don't want to trade any assets. I don't think right. that this team is built enough to be able to be putting themselves in that position. I know a lot of people can say, well, you know, they're a consistent quarterback away from being a contender. And I 100% agree with that. But you don't have to trade assets to be able to get a quarterback to do that for you. I think you could possibly have one in the building already. Or if you really want to go down that route and go uh, sign somebody in the offseason. But I I wouldn't agree with that either. I'm not for trading any assets. It doesn't have to do with Justin Fields. It's just any quarterback at that spot. Um, I Even at 19, I don't feel confident with Trey Lance. Um, but yep. the one thing I will say, when I did his film breakdowns, I didn't like the way that the college coach kept running him so much. I thought that he needed to stay in the pocket uh, and be able to throw the football, but they were running him consistently and often. Um, but the one thing I will say that I took away from watching Trey Lance's game, I thought that he was reminiscent of Aaron Rodgers when he was on the run, when he was escaping the pocket left to right. I thought that he was very ac- accurate outside of there, and that is very intriguing to me. That's where I would say I'm intrigued with Trey Lance as a project, as someone that needs to develop over time. What about you, Hall? Yeah, I'm definitely with you where I don't think this team needs to be trading away assets and dra- tra- draft picks to move up in the draft to draft anyone. If someone happens to fall to you at hopefully 19 when we win a division on Sunday, um, then you get that guy. But someone that I've been intrigued by, I've watched him his pretty much his whole career because 
I watch a lot of college football is uh, he it definitely fits into the new mold of the NFL where you're mobile, but can also be an effective passer. And I've been, I like Kellen Mons. I think he's going to be a, maybe a third, maybe fourth round pick type of guy. Unless someone obviously jumps up and takes him the second, which I don't think will happen. Mm. But uh, he's a mobile guy. He is a, an efficient passer from 2017. And as he became a starter until now, his completion percentage went from 51% to 63%. This year he went, oh yeah, he's 63%, sorry. Uh, oh, passer rating. His passer rating in his first year was 108. It jumped up to 147 this year. It's grown every single year, mm. except for it took a couple of points back a couple of years here and there. But I just think that he's an efficient passer. He's mobile, and I, he can sit and learn for a year and then come in maybe in his second year down the line. I would love to see that. Yeah, and that's a great one. What about you, Reed? Ah, ta, 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 ta. The quarterback classes, um, yeah, it, it really depends. <laughs> I mean, like – Trey, like you guys are 100 percent right about Trey Lance. The worst thing that could have happened to him was COVID because mm-hmm. he flashed so much potential and he saw so many tools there. But then the one showcase game that they had it was a little bit rough and it was kind of a weird thing to do anyway. But he's just not there yet. He's not ready yet. He, he's still new to the position. Uh, he, when he was coming out of high school, he wasn't even necessarily being scouted as a quarterback. So he's got all the ability in the world, but he you still see things that he needs to get better at uh, most of it just pocket awareness that'll come with time so would you not, w- would you trade up assets for a quarterback n- no no then unless zach wilson or in the very off chance that he gets aids and starts falling and trevor lawrence is there or something you don't you don't want to do that but one person that another name that has been starting to rise up draft boards apparently is uh desmond ritter from yeah, cincinnati yeah. he's somebody who, who in round two or three possibly some people are saying that he may even go round one now uh just out of the blue, but uh, he, he's somebody who I could definitely see fitting in with a lot of NFL teams. Now he kind of similar to Kellen Mond in a way he fits what you want in a new age NFL quarterback. Um, and he's got all the prototypical size of everything. So he's somebody else that you could take a look on, uh, take a look at, but yeah, really in round one, it, and you're not going to get one of those Mm-mm. studs unless you trade up and it's just, no, not, not right now. We have yeah. too many other holes. And I would want, that was the one name that I have circled as Kellen Mond uh, to do a film breakdown in the off season. I think that oh. he could be one of those guys oh, that is the mid to late rounders that could progress after a year. I, I just like his body set Um, and coming from Mississippi state. I think that in the sec going against those really good defenses, it kind of, forces these quarterbacks to play a certain way and that way i think works in the nfl uh thirsty dogs thirsty dogs run faster 19 touchdowns three interceptions i mean that's what pretty much a washington that's all we needed a quarterback in washington right now in this little uh, defensive window to open up is someone that can throw for 19 20 maybe 25 touchdowns max and maybe at five to seven maybe 10 turnovers interceptions at the max hmm. You know, someone to just manage the game, let the defense yeah. take over, do the thing. All right, thank you, Teddy. I don't know. I think with Kellen Mond, I, I'm 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 a little bit more cold on him than you guys are, probably. Mm-hmm. Only because for me, two his first two years starting at Texas A and M, sub sixty percent completion percentage, and now yeah. only barely floating above it. That's just not enough for me mm-hmm. at the college level. I, I I want you in the high sixties because it only gets harder from here. No. Yeah. I'm saying that's, that's a, a fantastic yeah. point, and that's that's why we're here, baby, to talk about that. Now, thank you very much, yeah. Teddy. That was a fantastic question by you because it was it was a conversation starter. Now, Scott Harley, the UK fan, has a couple great questions for us. I was on Andy's pod earlier, the DC Tweet Team podcast. I Oi. already answered Oi. this already. Oi. Um, but what part or team or position have been the most disappointing and impressive to you? So one being disappointing and one being impressive. And I'll start with you, Nathan. Well, I think the impressive one, hmm, I think that you've, you've, you've got to go with the offensive line, mm-hmm. right? Because right. we knew we had some known entities some known quantities there, but Morgan Moses, I think is outperformed. I, I, I can yep. still hear the chatter from last off season yep. of everybody mm-hmm. telling me that he was a bum and we I need know. to drop him. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody wants to cut the whole offensive line every single year <laughs> and, you know, Nobody wants to pay Brandon Sheriff, and I, I just don't get it. But if, if you watch just what they put together, you see the season that Cornelius Lucas has been able to put together at the left tackle position. It's very, very admirable. Uh, as far as a position group that has definitely let me down, probably the middle linebackers, I'll tell you that, because uh, you've seen flashes, you've seen some strong play, but at the same time, again, like I said earlier, nobody has stepped up and grabbed it by the horns. I was I was really hoping to see Ruben Foster this year, and I know that that was off the table before the season even began. 
but in just going back to you know the 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 latter parts of the off season the early summer that's disappointing um and then also i because I, I just feel like if we if rivera had that stud middle linebacker that luke keekley player to run the ship someone to to fill the gaps consistently and confidently every single play uh, you know i don't think it's i don't think it's a debate that we're the top one or two defense in the league and uh yeah. so that that's probably where i think i'm i'm most disappointed with yeah and Cole Holcomb being injured on and off all season kind of ruined that middle <laughs> linebacker spot trying to move around playing chess with it what about you Reed uh the position group that I've been the most impressed with has been running back so far uh, I, I don't think anybody expected Antonio Gibson to become this guy so That's far I said right now and and JD McKissick playing except as for well me as he has. well yeah except for Hall. <laughs> JD McKissick playing it playing as well as he has as honestly one of the best third down backs in the NFL so far this season um but then I, I can't uh, I was going to say linebackers as a whole, just uh, as a disappointment, but I'm going to go with a player that kind of just disappointed me. And that's Landon Collins when he was, mm. when he was healthy, Landon Collins mm-hmm. did not play up to his standard. He did not play anywhere near to what he's capable of. And, and I, Cameron Curl has just played fantastic. So yeah. who knows? I, there's some people out there just throwing it out there. I know this isn't Madden, but people are saying that they should switch Landon Collins to linebacker. They should do all sorts of stuff. So who knows what's going on with him, but it's been, very it was very frustrating watching him until the dallas game he started playing fantastic and then he got hurt that very same game yeah that's a great one what about you hall what is the most impressive position group and not impressive that's disappointing uh most impressive i will go with this secondary just as a whole um kendall fuller a lot of people kind of question not really questioned it because they said it was a good hire or a good signing but they kind of said he's a nickel back kind of free safety right. guy he can't be a number one well, he's been a pretty good cornerback this yep. year, in my opinion, and PFF's opinion. Um, and then, like I said, Cameron Curl merging and being a, a pretty good uh, safety, becoming an emerging star, hopefully, in this defense. Uh, Jimmy Marlins stepped up this year. Ronald Darby yeah. got a lot of uh, got a lot of dirt thrown on his he's name. He's been really him. impressive. Exactly. Yeah, he got a lot of really dirt impressive. thrown on his name from his Philly days and yep. how he couldn't really play. He was washed up and injury prone. He's gotten through the season, and he's been awesome this year. So the secondary has really impressed me. Um, honestly, the only thing that's really, like you guys said, it's the middle linebackers and just the linebackers as a whole. Yeah. If you want to call it that, just yeah. uh, we definitely need, that's like the one major glaring hole in the defense. And we definitely got to upgrade that through the draft or free agency. Yeah. And- ABL has been a pretty good player, but yeah, right. you know, he's been off. He's up and down off. And but he on. is who he is. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. He is Where who he is. is. He's, a, he's a jag. If you want to call yeah, it, you know, his right. ceiling. Now, when I was on with Andy's pod, I said the most impressive was the running back position. The one name you guys didn't talk about, Peyton Barber, we all talked crap about. He's actually been a solid running back for the short yardage situation as well. He has really done well in those fourth and ones, third and inches. He does get that extra yard. He He's done his job. So I think the running back position has been. Now, the most disappointing for me, guys, is the quarterback position. Yeah. Now, when you talk about Scott Turner and a young coordinator, he's needed that kind of consistent quarterback play to gel with, and he hasn't been granted that at all. The quarterback position with the fourth quarterback now this year, I felt like that was the most disappointing because we, we interviewed multiple people from the organization and they all picked Dwayne Haskins to be the number one player that was going to uh, really get better under Ron Rivera. And that did not prove to be correct. So for me, it's the quarterback position. How crazy is it that uh, last offseason we're just thinking Dwayne Haskins and Darius Geis were our future? And yeah, now look at them. It's insane. <laughs> oh, look at both of them. Absolutely Jeez. insane. Now, real quick, we have to you go. Know, I just, well, oh, sorry. Go, go. Oh, sorry. No, I was just I just wanted to float out there. Two things you guys brought up was Antonio Gibson. I need to eat my words a little bit on, on him because very talented guy. I've, I've not seen a running back come to the league without vision, develop vision. Yeah. So that has been incredibly impressive to see. And the other he, note it, was on him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the other note was on Ronald Darby, second in the league in pass breakups with 16. Yeah. I can't remember the last time I've seen an individual player break up as many passes I've seen from him. For a guy mm-hmm. whose book on him was getting beat by the double teams, you know, you would think it would have happened a lot more by now, but he's he's really upped his game and, right. and it's been impressive. And uh, Jimmy Moreland, heading into, at least heading into Sunday, was either the seventh or ninth highest rated uh cornerback and according to pff overall which mm-hmm. is surprising i didn't know i knew he was playing well i didn't know he was playing that well yeah he's playing out of his mind like uh, coach savage would say he's a dog and yes he is jimmy moreland is the real deal now Space scott's guy scott's last yeah. question scott's last question is actually a really good one um looking back at the draft class from this year 
what would you grade it? And let's not get explanations and everything because we have to go on to the game. But I'll start with you, Reed. What grade would you give the draft class? I'm gonna give it an A. Just anytime you get that that franchise pass rusher, you get a you get a fantastic running back. Some of these other guys, you said not to get into it, but I'm gonna give them an A. I love this draft class. I think it has more potential too than what they've shown with Sadiq Charles and AGG. I'm gonna give them an A. And you're a big draft guy, Nathan. Or do you agree with uh, Mike Reed that it's an A? Yeah, I'm giving you an A. Whenever you start the draft with a guy like Chase Young and you finish the draft with a guy like Cam Curl, I'm yeah. not sure how you could walk away with anything else than an A. No. Now, I'm going to say B plus just to be indifferent. And the reason being is that uh, the middle rounds we kind of did not get hit on, uh, in my personal opinion, with ADG with, and Keith Ishmael is one that we thought that maybe uh, possibly we would see. Uh, but I was talking with Colonel today, and I was saying, you know, maybe Ron Rivera is just giving – making sure that he's the backup center. They don't want to force him in at guard at some point and him being injured. Then who do you have at center yeah. if something happens with Rouye? So that, in my opinion, B plus it, of course it's an A. Of course it's an A. Mm -hmm. what are, are you do agree hall? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I was going to give it a B just because like you said, we hit on the first pick chase young, obviously monster mm -hmm. last pick seventh rounder cam curl monster. Uh, you had uh, Smith Williams, like I said, who's contributing on uh, special teams and, Probably will stay on the hopefully be on the team next year. Special teams, maybe take that jump, give some reps as a pass rusher. And <clears> the <throat> only reason I'll give it a B is because you guys, guys like AGG, who was injury plagued, didn't really get on the field a lot. Obviously, my guy Antonio Gibson was a hit. Mm -hmm. But uh, outside of that, yeah, like you said, Ishmael didn't really get on the field a lot, but that's because of, I guess, because he was young, didn't really know the offense yet. Right. So uh, definitely be uh, the first, the, the bun. The bun is there. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. got to get the meat ready to go. Another person who's actually surprisingly gotten more playing time and actually played decent has been Khalik Hudson. Yeah. yeah. But Khalik Hudson, hey, he's, he's, he's been exactly. solid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course, he hasn't been a world burner, but he's been very, he's, he's been a good special teams he's player. Well. Yeah. He's produced. Now, let's get into the Sunday night matchup going against the Philadelphia Eagles. This is all for the marbles, fellas. This is essentially a playoff game. It's win or go home. Their, their backs are up against the wall. They've had three chances to solidify themselves into the playoffs and have squandered it twice, so this is the last chance that they have. Um, and let's go with Jesse's questions because they're all geared around the game. Does Jack Del Rio need to go all out on defense to confuse and blitz Hurts, or does he play it safe? And I'll start with you, Reed. Uh, Jalen Hurts for, for, I know he's a young guy. I know it's different when you're in the NFL, but Jalen Hurts is a very smart, experienced quarterback in college. I mean, starting at Alabama for as long as he did, as young as he was, and then going to Oklahoma, obviously the only thing you can do is with playing time is improved. So he's, he's not an elite, you know, he doesn't have elite awareness or football IQ, but he's still a very, very smart guy. He's not your average rookie when it comes to that type of stuff. Um, but yeah, I would love to see what Jack Del Rio has, has dialed up. Like we've said, we've struggled with mobile quarterbacks so far this year. Um, I, I really think that he's got to figure out a way to affect Jalen Hurts and keep him inside the pocket. And then that'll really help out because then it, that, that it's erases a lot of his game. You know, if he can't move, mm -hmm. then it is what tough. it is. And what about yeah. you, Nathan? Do you think that Jack Del Rio needs to mix it up a little bit, pressure um, Jalen Hurts a little bit more than they have with other mobile quarterbacks? I definitely want to see some creative blitzing coming from Jack Del Rio, but especially to start the game while we try to grab momentum ourselves. Yeah. I really just want to keep him in the pocket. I would much prefer just a four-man rush with a shallow linebacker playing in a, essentially a spy. The last thing I want is for him to get on the move and build some confidence off of us missing a tackle in the open field, something that puts him in an excellent position to succeed. I want him to stick in the pocket. I want to get hands in his face. And I, I just want to make sure every time he does throw the ball, he's still sitting in there and he's getting hit, taking it to his ribs. And then we're going to see how he handles throughout the game. Yeah, I knew I should have went before you. You just uh, took mm -hmm. it right out of my mouth, 150%. Because I was going to say, I don't think that blitzing is going to be the point of emphasis, but what I like to see is a QB spy. I would like to see someone following Jalen Hurts because you're expecting Chase Young and these guys to pressure the quarterback, but at the same time being able to keep their gap integrity. And we've seen in these losses against the Mobile quarterbacks that they're 0-4 in, they don't blitz a lot. You know, they kind of do the contain and make the quarterback stay in the pocket, but what happens is they lose gap integrity and they're able to get upfield for huge gains. We saw that with Russell Wilson. Now, if you're able to have Khalid Hudson, or if you can have Cameron Curl act as a QB spy with Reeves in the back end, I think you're in a very good position to keep 
Hurts in the pocket, like you said, Nathan, because he's not going to want to run out of it. Every time he gets out of it, he's going to get brought down. It's going to be a hurry. So I would love to have the QB spy aspect on it. Keep the front four rushing and then keep one of those linebackers or one of those safeties on Jalen Hurts to make sure that he doesn't kill you with your feet because that cannot happen. What about you, Hall? The last thing I want to see – oh, sorry, Hall, but the, the last thing I want to see is – a blitz where where Hertz rolls out, and I'm in a situation with Reeves one on one with Deshaun Jackson. I don't want to see yeah. it. I want to avoid that at all costs. Yeah. I want the play. I want him to feel comfortable having the play finish in two or three seconds. I'm okay if we're not getting a ton of sacks and he's just thinking and dunking right. because I want to keep the play in front of us. Absolutely, and that's a great way to put it. What about you, Hall? Yeah, uh, I think he needs to do a mixture of both. I think he needs to know when to bring the pressures and bring the house, uh, maybe do some exotic little stunts with the linemen, bring some, uh, bring a pressure from maybe the secondary or something like that. And uh, definitely know when to play it safe where, like you guys mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, keep your integrity, keep your rush lanes, don't let him get outside the pocket, keep him inside the pocket, make him beat you with his arm because obviously the strength of him right now is his legs. Mm. So uh, definitely uh, I think a mixture of everything should be what we need to get the job done. Yeah, and that's a great way to put it. Now, yeah. Jesse's next question is, what do you, what do they have to do to win the game? So what I'll do is I'll kind of absorb this and, and move it around because I, we always ask the question, Nathan, what is one area or facet of the game that the Washington football team has to dominate in order to put themselves in a position to win? And so let's kind of go with that. What would you say that would be, Nathan? There's only one thing that I think that they need to pull off, and that's the turnover margin. Mm. We need to not have any self-inflicted wounds. The Eagles are a team. And I know people have already said it. They're, they're not playing for anything beyond spoiler. I think that as long as we capture the momentum, we will at some point capture momentum. As long as when we do that, we are at least tied or hopefully up at that point, we will keep it because there's, no, there's not going to be fighting a dead dog. Once you start putting them down, they will stay down. And we just need to win the turnover battle because the last thing we need to do is let them in, in a game that they really don't have any business playing in. Yeah, it, for me uh, – I said, I said it earlier, they have to keep this close, you know, especially in the first half. If they're able to keep it within one score or even have a lead, I think they're in a position to win the football game. Don't let this, like you said, Nathan, don't cause turnovers. Do not allow it to be easy for Philly to score points. Make them earn it. And if they're doing that, I think they're in a very, very good position to win the football game. What about you, Reed? Uh, yeah, I mean, kind of just piggybacking. It's similar to what you were saying, Kyle, but... Uh my biggest thing is it's something that we've only seen a couple of times this year is they need to start fast. We talk about it every week. Mm -hmm. They can't come out, get sluggish, get down behind 17 to three, like we say every week. And then all of a sudden they have to fight their way back. I want to see them come out. I want to see them play smart fundamental football and I don't want to see them beat themselves. And that's the biggest thing is they always get these plays or these penalties that they'll be doing decent. And then all of a sudden they'll get something that'll just kill their momentum. And then it's gone for the entire first half. Right. So they, they just need to play smart football and then, do their jobs, and I think that they will be okay in the first half. Yeah. What about you, Hall? Do you agree with us? Yeah, I agree with you. Definitely, we got to win the turnover battle because obviously last week, Stephen Sims doesn't fumble that touchdown. Yeah. Defense gives up 13 points. We should be able to win that game. Yep. But I'm gonna go with uh, we got to be able to stop Miles Sanders. We got to be able to stop the run. Mm -hmm. He didn't play week one against us, and if you remember back to last year, he just destroyed yep. us mm -hmm. in the second game of the season towards the end. And we got to be able to stop him, hold him, to contain him, take away the read option from Jalen Hurts because, again, like I just said previous, keep him in the pocket, make you make him beat you with his arm, and take away the RPO out of the offense that Doug Peterson can't call. So, uh, yeah, definitely contain Miles Sanders in that run game with Jalen Hurts as well. Absolutely. Andy, I know you, we haven't answered your questions yet, but I'm going to bump that to the end of the episode because we're going to keep it inside of this game, all right? Now, let's get into something that I want to talk about. <laughs> Um, what is the, per let, let's say a percentage, you know, of being able to win the football game. Let's say you have Alex Smith. I would just for an example, Alex Smith is at 70%. What would you have Taylor Heineke? Like, what is your difference in percentage of the win of it being Heineke starting or Alex Smith starting? And I'll start with you, Nathan. I think that it definitely drops. If you have an Alex Smith that isn't thinking about his legs, that's not hampered. Like he's just going out there and playing. We're probably not going to put up a ton of points. We're also probably not going to turn the ball over, right? I feel pretty strong. I would say I would expect us to win two-thirds of the time with that type of a, of a, of a, a situation. If we put in Heineke, you know, you'd love to get excited about the way that he finished last week. But realistically, I think that we drop probably down to, to a 40 to 50% chance. And only because 
he's a guy with the propensity to 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 sling it and mm-hmm. that means turning it over right he's a guy that's not scared of down the field and that was really exciting last week when it worked but we also saw him sail a seam route to, to stevenson's and that's just mm-hmm. that type of play is what's going to kill us when we come out there uh now the granite he seemed pretty instinctual with his legs he yep. seemed a guy that had no problem checking it down i really like seeing all that so it's hard to completely write it off but i would say i definitely would expect him to throw one or two interceptions over what I would expect from Alex Smith. So, so that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, he reminds me of Brett Favre uh, mm-hmm. a, a lot because he does Favre. have that, that, that gunslinger kind of mentality. Uh, 150%, I agree with you. Keith alluded to it on Tuesday that, you know, he was kind of just, what did he have to lose? You know, was just th- throwing it to throw it. Um, and so it made a lot of sense that he did well because he didn't really care. But going into this game, if he has all four quarters – the gunslinger mentality does worry me quite a bit. Um, if he, he would put it in the opposition's hands more than he should, and we, like you said, Nathan, they got to win the turnover battle. What about you, Reed? Uh, yeah, I mean, we really haven't seen enough of Taylor Heineke to really give him a fair assessment or really know what's going on. All you could really do is base it off of his career so far. So, I, I, he, to me, it was just he came in at the right time. Uh, he was playing a Panthers team. If I'm being realistic, that was giving him some looks that he could definitely diagnose because they were up and, and, and he, they were, they were okay with giving up the big pass. It was, it wasn't that big of a deal to them at that point. Um, but I do still like what I saw. I mean, you got to love the grit. You got to love his, the, his demeanor. You got to love his just a natural feel for, for the, for the rush and just the way that he sees coverages seems to be pretty good. And he seems to throw a pretty good ball. The gunslinger mentality definitely worries you over four quarters. Um, so I'm going to say, obviously with Alex Smith, Kyle, you know you're going to get a significantly higher percentage to win that game than you are with Taylor Heineke. However, with Taylor Heineke, I still think that they could definitely win as long as he plays smart football. Yeah, and do his best Alex Smith impersonation. You know, yeah. use your, use those tools when it's needed, just not all the time. Don't think you have to do it yourself. Right. Generally, that's when the turnovers happen. Get what about you, Hall? checkdowns in rhythm. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I'm with you guys. Um, I guess, like you said, if Alex Smith is like a 70-30 split where you think there's a 70% chance they win, if uh, Heineke's in there, I would go probably a coin flip. It's 50-50. Mm. Everything you guys just hit on, the gunslinger mentality, you love it, but you hate it. I can't really be, like, a critic of it because I was, like, advocating for Ryan Fitzpatrick to be the uh, quarterback for a year next year. <laughs> he has COVID, by the way. Yeah, he oh, does. Really? Just, yeah, it just what? came out, yeah. Mm-hmm. Shit. Well, guess the Dolphins are about to lose That's this game. Fitz um, <laughs> That's Fitz tragic. I'll show myself. I'm going <laughs> to <laughs> <laughs> But, no, I definitely think that uh, – if they, if, I know that the reports came out that Alex Smith was uh, taking the first team reps today in practice, which is a great sign. Uh, they were saying he looked a little bit more fluid, a lot more fluid on his leg, which is a great sign. So uh, I kind of expect Alex to look and be the starter on Sunday. But again, if it's Heineke, I guarantee uh, Rivera sat him down and said pretty much like you just said, do your best Alex Smith impression. Don't try to go out there and win the game for us. Don't just don't lose it for us. And uh, that's yeah, what I fully expect. But again. I expect Alex to be out there and put on a, a decent enough showing to get us to win. Yeah, but last week we saw that he did practice. He looked good, and then Sunday came around, and he was stiff a little bit, and they pulled him out. So I'm not putting yeah. much stock into Alex. Not yeah. until Sunday, until we actually hear. Uh, he's kind of been playing fool's gold a little bit. The Ron good thing has. is it's a Sunday night game, so he has all the, the day it's of Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. And up, see what to he be does. completely honest, I don't think that there's that big of a chance Alex Smith misses this game. With his yeah. warrior mentality and stuff, I, I think that – even if it's hurting, he's going to try to cover it up and see if how that game. works. Maybe he'll get pulled. Exactly. Maybe he'll get pulled in the first quarter because it'll be blatantly obvious, but I think he's going to at least give it a try. Yeah. yeah. Now, Nathan, I know you had already talked about earlier your keys to the game uh, to be able to get a victory, but what player concerns you the most on Philly? Ooh. It's got to be Miles Sanders, right? You bottle him up they're going to you're going to you're going to suffocate their flame right there's there's no there's no path to success for them without miles sanders having a strong game you know and, and our defense has been really good all year long on the whole but we've definitely seen stretches where it looks like seven yard run eight yard run six yard run right back to back to back to back and you're like scratching your head and that goes back to the linebacker conversation we having earlier of just a little bit of a hesitancy filling those holes. So that that's – I don't know that it scares me because I've never been that big of a fan of Miles Sanders as a whole, but he's definitely their strongest weapon, I think, to attack us. I'm not that worried about Jalen Hurts. I, I think you, you watched a flash in the pan 
a little bit. I'm not saying that he's not going to continue to have success with Philly, but right now, I don't think he's that developed guy yet. And so I think we're going to watch some rookie mistakes as, as mm -hmm. more teams are getting film on him. They're slowly starting to see him through the cracks. So I, I, I'm, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, and mine is going to be predicated upon the injury report because as of today, the number of Eagles on the daily injury report jumped from 10 to 12 with Miles Sanders and Jalen Mills being added to it. So the one player I would say, if he is playing, is Fletcher Cox. The dude is the difference maker on the defense. He has been proven to be a thorn in the uh, backside of Washington whenever they play them. And without Fletcher Cox, I think they have a very good chance of being able to run the ball well and effectively and being able to control the clock. So Fletcher Cox is the number one for me. But if he's not going, it's going to be DJX. In the losses this season, there has been a correlation between mm -hmm. giving up big plays through the air and you know djax is a deadly threat downfield and so if they're able to get the ball downfield to djax i think that's a recipe for disaster in my personal opinion most likely i don't think he's think i think they're gearing toward him not playing but if he does that does concern me a lot what what about you reed uh i'll keep it on the defensive line just because you guys took two pretty good ones obviously i was going to go miles sanders then fletcher cox but now i'm going to go with brandon graham i, I think brandon mm -hmm. graham is just such a good football player who never really got the recognition that he deserved. He's just so solid all around. And yes, this offensive line has played fantastic that they've played exceeded expectations by a mile. Uh, and I really love them, but he's just such a good player that, I mean, you got to try to figure out a way to defend him on every play. You got to know, you got to know what he's doing. You got to know exactly where he is. So Brandon Graham, somebody that always concerns me. So that he's somebody that will always have an effect on the outcome of the game. So I'll go with Brandon Graham. Yeah, and one thing I just wanted to say that there is a good chance that uh, Mayalata, uh, their left tackle, may not be playing in this game. And their starting left tackle could very well be Prince Tega Wanoho. Uh, he was, he was the tackle for Auburn, and I did a film breakdown on him. He He's okay, but he is very raw in his technique and fundamentals. And when you're facing against Montez Sweat and Chase Young, I think there's a recipe there, and there, we could see some a lot of sack numbers possibly piling I up. I hope so. the broadcast team is preparing how they're going to pronounce his name because they're <laughs> yeah. going to be bringing it up a lot with Chase Young showing him the oh, business. Yeah. Prince Tega Winoho, I remember yeah. from when we yeah. when we from the from the draft. Uh, yep. What about you, Hall? What's one player that concerns you the most on Philly? You usually have a great one with this. Yeah, I had to pull one out because everyone took all the good ones, but this is a pretty good one. <laughs> I'm going to go with Malcolm Jenkins. Uh, I, it's like, gonna, I thought you were going to say Zach Ertz, man. Nah, I'm not really worried about Zach Ertz. He's took a decline. Malcolm He's Jenkins been, on this. Malcolm I mean, look, Zach Ertz state. does like the tight ends do kill us, and the linebackers have been poor this year. Malcolm Jenkins but, isn't on Philly, bro. Yeah, Malcolm Jenkins. Oh, on he's the on the Saints now. Yeah. You're right. Well, mm -hmm. damn. Darius <laughs> Slay. Go Darius Slay. No, nah, I'll go Zach Ertz. Nah, I'm not worried about the Darius. Dallas Slay. Goddard. Somebody. Yeah. Yeah, Dallas. I'm gonna go Dallas Goddard if he plays. I know he's questionable. Yeah. And Zach Ertz. Yep. Because tight ends have killed us all season. That's been the thorn in our side for years and years and years. I know this is a new defense, but Again, Dallas Goddard scored on us week one pretty easily. Yeah, I know it's a different defense, huge different defense from week one. But if I had to guess, that's going to be Jalen Hurst is trying to, like, go to guys because he's going to be able to have to uh, get the ball out really quick and uh, have to do the little uh, dump outs and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah Zach Ertz, Dallas Goddard combo. Yeah, and yeah. so that being said, me bringing up the injury report, possibly Prince Tegawinoho possibly starting at left tackle. Even if they start Mayalata at left tackle, he's injured, obviously. He's not practicing, not in the best of shape. But we saw in week one that this defense went to work. They were able to get after Carson Wentz early and often, all game long with limited amount of pressure being applied, and they were able to get after him. So do you guys think that they'll be able to kind of replicate those sack numbers, Nathan? I'm not sure they're going to be able to replicate those sack numbers because of the scheme. Uh, I, I don't think – I mean, I guess it, it depends on what Del Rio decides right. to bring. But, again, I think it's going to be more of a thought of contain. Because the last thing that you need, especially if you're bringing four, is it, and it, your DN's crashing too hard and creating a lane for him to bounce out. And so I think it, I think you're going to watch a lot of those, those tackle end stunts that you see Young do a lot where he slides over the middle and basically puts his hand up and is just reading the play. I think we're going to see a lot of that. And so I, I wouldn't expect a ton of sacks off of a game plan like that. And that makes the most sense. What about you, Reed? Uh, I, I think, yeah, it's, um, I hope it's similar to week one with the injuries on their offensive line, our talent on the defensive line that I really hope that we make Jalen Hurts. I'm going to show myself out once again, guys. It was nice seeing you. <laughs> Great episode, Reed. Great episode. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that was, I hope, yeah, fuck it. Yeah, we're, we're doing it. We're getting them. We're getting it done. What about you all? 
Yeah, I don't think we're going to be able to get seven or anywhere near seven, but I do right. think they get at least four. I think that mm. there will be enough coverage and enough, uh, enough rush from the interior to kind of disrupt Jalen Hurts, get him off his mark. And again, I think they're going to be able, they're going to be able to make him beat him in the passing game with his arm. I don't think he's going to be able to do that. He's going to have to hold on to the ball a lot and make decisions. And here comes Chase Young, Montez Sweat around the corner. It's not looking good. Four plus sacks, I think, for me. And I love to hear that because I would love for them to be able to get after Jalen Hurts without sending extra pressure, doing containment, and still being able to get four sacks. That's a recipe for success, in my opinion. You got to also think about they're going to have someone spying him and they know he's going to pass the ball. They can just instantly blitz in, make another fifth rusher. So yeah. look at that aspect as well. Absolutely. Now let's get into our score predictions and MVP. And so I'll start with you, Reed. What do you think the score is going to be and who's going to be the most valuable player of the game? You know what, since uh, I think two weeks ago, Hall, our, our magic kind of wore itself out. Yeah, because then it's, done. Didn't, yeah, it's, it's done. done. So that's good. It is. Uh, we, can but, start new, we can start a new trend. Yeah, we can start a new trend. So I, I think Washington does win this game, uh, I, I think. But that Ron, there's no chance in hell that Ron Rivera is not going to have these guys fired up. It might not be right away because this team, uh, they, they like to start slow. But when they come out of that locker room, they're going to come out. I don't know why I started talking like Obama. <laughs> but when they come out of the locker room, is going to be laying into him. Uh, you know, I was looking at him like, is he doing Obama right now? <laughs> uh, let me be clear. What we need is more drone strikes. Um, but no, I, I think that there's no chance in hell Ron Rivera and Jack Rio do not have these guys fired up to play. And that's, It'll be either before the game or at halftime, but they're going to find a way to win this game. Um, let's see. I'm going to say what I always say. We're going to be down 17 to three at the half, and then we're going to storm <laughs> our way back with a fiery output on the ground and through the air, and we are going to end up winning this game 21 to 17, and we're going to pitch a shutout in the second half, and just because that's what Washington always does. Yeah. Pin pinch out of Who's your MVP? Win. Oh, my MVP? Oh, man, man. My MVP? Oh, man. It's going to be Jay Gruden, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, my MVP, it's going to – let's just go with everybody's favorite player right now. I'm going to go with Chase Young mm -hmm. just because I think this is where he shows up. This dude is too passionate about football with Ron Rivera and Jack Del Rio lighting the fire under his ass. And the offs. Feeling like he has to do it, yep, single-handedly. The offs. I think he can have a Lighting good game, offs. especially against Prince Tega. <laughs> what about you, Hall? What is your score prediction and your MVP of the game? I, I, I have a feeling where you're going to go with this. You already know where I'm going to go with the MVP. But uh, I think that we need to switch it up, man. We need to come out on defense and get the defense going and, like, yeah. not even worry about starting off fast on offense. Worry about the defense getting out there. Let them, like, set the tone for the rest of the game. But with that being said, I think that we do win this game. I think that the defensive line dominates like they did all season long or most of the season long. I think the front seven hopefully holds up against Miles Sanders, limits him in the rushing game. I think that we win this game. I'll go 27, 20, 27, 19. And my MVP, no, you know what? Yeah, my MVP of the game is none other than my boy, my guy, my next jersey, Antonio Gibson. I think Antonio Gibson rushes for three touchdowns this game. He looked so good last week. Yes, three touchdowns. Did. Bounce back game. Three touchdowns. We're calling three Big touchdowns. Game Gibby. Big game for Gibby. Woo, Gibby's eating, I guess. What about Big you, Big game Gibby. That's what I'm calling him for now on. Nathan, are we going to the playoffs? Are we doing what your T-shirt says? Did not wear this by accident, gentlemen. All right, so <laughs> we're definitely going to win. Uh, no, what I'm thinking, I'm predicting a score 27-13. I think you're looking at a tight game. I think it's 13-10. It's floating there for most of the game, and I'm expecting two fourth-quarter touchdowns, one of them being defense-aided, either on defense mm. or given to us by a, a great play by the defense, Chase Young, uh, and also the other down. one being Martin from Antonio Swat. Gibson falling out, yeah. uh, who is subsequently – thanks for, for making me go last on this one. Uh, I'll take it from Hall – is Antonio Gibson. Uh, that's who I think is going to be the MVP here. I think Fletcher Cox is going to make a business decision. I think he's going to sit. Yep. Uh, or if he plays, he's definitely going to be on a snap count because what, what are you putting your body through right. at that point, at this point of the season for mm -hmm. a lost season? And uh, I, I think we walk away with a pretty decisive win, feeling pretty confident going into the next week. Yeah, and I have to agree with you. I was on Andy's pod earlier, and I predicted 24-13. to 13. 
Um, but I will say, I hope they wear the white on whites, and I they hope will. that, and I hope that somebody returns something for a touchdown. I want to see the dive, That's what I'm baby. Saying. I want Chase to see the Young, dive. Reminiscent of Sean Taylor, yeah, carrying oh, a fumble down in the fourth That'd quarter to seal it to clinch it. Now, for my MVP prediction, it is all predicated on if Terry is playing. If Terry plays, I think that he will be the MVP of the game. I think that he's going to be able to eat up this secondary early and often throughout the game. I think he'll be consistent. If Terry is not in the game, I definitely see Logan Thomas being a red zone threat. That could be a huge point of emphasis for them being able to move the chains. So that's where I'm going with there. Um, But I I love to hear that we're uh, that we're going to be going to the playoffs, baby. Now that being said, we we we, I told Andy we would end this off with him, and so Andy's question is. If you get to the if they get to the playoffs, how far can they go? Realistic expectation. I'll start with you, Reed. Uh, how far can they go? I mean, we've seen anything happen before. All it takes is a team to get hot and, and get the ball rolling, especially if they have Antonio Gibson going, which you guys are predicting in this win. And you got look, you get a good running game going, you get a solid defense. Look at the Titans last year. Look at what they did. They upset mm-hmm. some teams. They made it all the way to the conference championship game. I'm sorry. No, they made it. They, you know, they beat the Ravens. Yeah, they did make it to the conference. Yeah, they made it to the Chiefs. I was saying the Texans Chiefs, and then I was like, wait a minute. That was mm-hmm. the next round for the first or the second round. But, uh, yeah, I think that this team, honestly, it's one of those weird seasons. It's a COVID season. The sky's the limit. You never know what could happen. You never know. I'm just going to say that, guys. You don't. <laughs> you never know. They could do it. They could win the entire thing, and we could all be crying from seeing our first championship. I would literally cry real. Time. I would. I would seriously cry if that happened. I'm not gonna lie. It'd be uh, a little bit baby alligator tears, but I'd be no real tears. Native <laughs> American tears. Dude, real. real tears. Tears. I'll I'll be crying, running down the street, butt ass naked, in 20 degree letter uh, weather. I'll tell you that right now. I will have no shame in doing that. Do I think they win the Super Bowl? That no, I don't. I, I think that they'll probably lose round one, but you never know. What about you, Nathan? If they do beat Philly, like we all expect them to do this weekend, how far do you think that this team can go realistically? I think it's incredibly matchup dependent. Um, just want to throw this out there. I was playing Madden the other night, played against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, won in the last second. There you go. It sounds like an omen to me. Hey. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. But no, but seriously, it, it's incredibly matchup dependent. I don't actually, uh, I don't hate the matchup versus Tampa Bay just because you have an immobile quarterback who I think could be rattled with some, some of that defensive line pressure. And so and I know they have a strong defense, but really I, I, I would only look for our offense to put up 17 points in a game like that. So I think that uh, we can certainly win one I'm not expecting. And so we're just playing with house money right now. I'm just happy that we can get to the playoffs. I think what you do is you build, you build so much confidence in the way the system is operating, that culture that we talk about so much, that intangible, tangible thing. And um, I, I think when you have this group of young core players going into next season, just getting there is huge. Yeah, and I've said this going back to the offseason. I've said it many times. Two of the Super Bowls came in strike seasons for the Washington football team. It would only be fitting that they would go far and possibly win it <laughs> in a season like this. Um, but that being said, I talked about with Andy earlier. I thought when if they can win this game with their backs up against the wall, it's reminiscent of when the Nationals won the title, where they had they were going in hot, beating some very good teams, and they just went on a roll. And Ron Rivera was 100% right. Nobody wants to play you guys right now. And so if they beat Philly, like dominating them where they don't even have a chance in the game and have that kind of momentum, I don't think anybody really does want to play this football team right now. They are playing confidently and doing it well. They just have to get out of their own way. What about you, Hall? How far do you think they can go? Yeah, uh, I'll just go one and done just to be like realistic. But like you said, I could definitely see something crazy happening. Like we get this win on Sunday, hopefully. And then like Nathan said, matchup dependent. Tom Brady's had the biggest trouble against defensive lines that can get after him because again, he's not mobile. And if you can take away the quick passing game of Tampa Bay, hold the rushing game down with Ronald Jones or Fournette, you never know. And then if you go to the uh, <clears throat> LA Rams, if they win this game on Sunday, Jared, Jared Goff back off of surgery. How's he going to look? Mm-hmm. And uh, I if know he's Henderson, even going to play, if he's even going to play Henderson's going to be out with the, the ankle sprain camp makers might still be out. So you can never know how that goes. And Cooper pull, Cup's on COVID list right now. And COVID list, exactly. But if we pull Arizona, we pull Kyler Murray, I don't know how that's going to go. I don't like it. I don't like our matchup against that one. Mm. But either way, like I said, I'll be realistic. I can be. I can see us one and done. Yeah. How and, weird is it to say that we might face Tom Brady in the playoffs? Just, right. just like over. Like, <laughs> they told me that last offseason. I'd be like, don't, we're going to the Super Bowl? 
Oh my god. Right. I do think that people are overhyping the Bucks just a little bit, in my personal opinion. I don't I'm not entirely impressed by them, especially on defense. If you can control the clock, keep that offense off the field, that you can easily beat that team. Nathan, I can't thank you enough for joining the yes, pod. Um, it Hell was like yeah. it was like interviewing my twin because apparently just we think very very similarly. I really do appreciate you taking the time out, uh, kind of explaining yourself and uh, who you are and your fandom. Thank you for reaching out, wanting to come on, dude. This was a phenomenal episode. I can't thank you enough. Oh, show. No, I very much appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me. I had a great time. Anytime. Uh, of yeah. course. All right, yeah, everybody. Definitely. I'm Kyle. I'm Hall. Uh, and I just also want to say that. Hall, I feel like it's also. I feel like sometimes when I'm looking at you, I'm looking at my twin. So like, I, just, I know, man. <laughs> We're here with it, man. We're here with it. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm Reed. All right, all right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Have a happy new year. Please be safe. No drinking and driving. We will see you guys next year. We'll have another episode for you on Tuesday. Please go and rate us on iTunes, on YouTube. Uh, please subscribe. And we're also on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We are all over the place. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll, we going to the Alps. We going to the Alps. We'll see we going you guys. for the Alps. We'll, we'll, right. we'll see you guys on Tuesday talking about the possible playoff matchup. How about that? Washington football. Woo! The Alps. Washington football. Woo!